of all the superheroes, Spider-Man has always been my favorite. This is a picture of me in my research laboratory at Northeastern University, where we studied the regenerative ability of animals. Almost 25 years ago, my little brother and I came across this Spider-Man in a comic book store window. It wasn't for sale, somehow we talked the owner into letting us have it. This thing, no joke, has followed me across four states, through my undergraduate, graduate education, was stolen for two years, and like Spider-Man, usually comes back and is now hanging in the corner of my lab as our mascot. So what does Spider-Man have to do with regenerative medicine? So a lot of you probably saw the Spider-Man movie in 2012, right, where he had to fight the Lizard King. Well, in this movie, Spider-Man, AKA Peter Parker, was an aspiring scientist. And he came up with a formula. So this formula was to regenerate his mentor's arm, Dr. Connors. Really cool movie, really cool science fiction, right? But the idea of regenerating organs and parts of our body have fascinated thinkers for millennia. Traditionally, medicine aims to alleviate symptoms, right? Try to make the condition livable. But advances in regenerative medicine are starting to turn this imagination into reality. Let me give you an example. There's a disease, one of the worst diseases you'll ever come across, called junctional epidermolysis bullosa, or JEB. The cause of JEB is a genetic mutation in a gene. And the function of this gene is to glue our skin to our body. Children with JEB are otherwise known as butterfly children because their skin is as fragile as a butterfly's wing. The slightest impact to their skin is to an open chronic wound. Watching these children change their, their dressing every other day seems like one of the most excruciating things you could ever go through. Can't play on the playground, continuous hospital visits, and about 50% of the children don't make it to adolescence. There's currently no cure for this. In June 2015, a seven-year-old boy named Hassan was administered to the Children's Burn Unit in Ruhr University in Germany. Hassan was most likely going to die. JEB took 80% of this boy's skin. In a last-ditch effort, some international, an international team of researchers from Italy and Germany came up with a new, new solution. They collected only one and a half inches of this boy's skin, smaller than this, than this pointer. And they collected the stem cells from this skin and fixed the genetic mutation. They then grafted these stem cells that make his skin as well as yours and eyes back onto Hassan, and they took and they outcompeted the, 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 the diseased cells. They actually replaced the entirety of his skin. This is a picture of Hassan actually playing soccer. He went back to elementary school in March of 2016. And the doctor said he even has hair growing through this new skin. So just think of this, right? Instead of treating the condition and battling and then finally losing to JEB, they actually took a proactive approach and regenerated the largest organ in our body, which is our skin. So as a regenerative biologist, this is probably one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Now you might be thinking, right, the skin is something unique. We always turn over our skin, but we don't do this with other organs. And you're right to be skeptical. But what you don't know, most likely, is that we could regenerate as embryos. So there's clear evidence in mice and humans that we could repair and regenerate parts of our heart until shortly after birth. Until we're about teenagers, we can even regenerate parts of our fingers. So this is a classic study from 1974 where Cynthia Illingsworth showed that children can regenerate their digits if they're amputated distal to the last joint, as long as that wound's kept clean. That's pretty impressive. Unfortunately, most of these abilities to regenerate decline early in, in our lifetime. Furthermore, if you go back in the fossil record, our ancient ancestors that we evolved from, they could regenerate. You can see clearly from here that some tails and some limbs could regenerate of our ancient ancestors. So this shows us that regeneration is an evolutionarily ancient trait. So why did we lose this through development and through evolutionary history? It seems like a great trait to have. And even more importantly, how do we learn to tap back into these regenerative potentials that we have in our own DNA? 
we're in luck, right? Because nature is filled with superheroes, animals that can repair after injuries. So on the top, you're going to see a zebrafish. This animal can grow back parts of its tail, parts of its heart, and parts of its spinal cord. The animal on the bottom left is a hydra, which is practically immortal, shows no signs of aging. In one of my favorite animals, the planaria on the right, you can cut this animal into 15 different pieces, and it gives rise to 15 new animals. Yeah, that's kind of the baller move of superheroes in nature, I think. But we probably don't want 15 clones of ourselves running around, right? So we look for something a little bit closer to us, namely the axolotl salamander, Ambistum mexicanum. This animal has some of the most amazing regenerative abil abilities among vertebrates. I know it kind of looks like a Pokemon character with slimy skin and a tail, but really the same instructions that make yours an eye's limb is used to make this salamander's limb. But what happens very differently is after injury. So a spinal cord injury to you and I, permanent debilitating injury for the rest of our life. A spinal cord injury to an axolotl leads to fully functional repair. They make all the new neurons and all the new connections to regain full function. In fact, these animals can even regenerate parts of their heart, lung, ovary, retina, and practically any other organ you can think of. They can grow it back. Pretty cool trait to have, I would think. So it's actually a pretty interesting year this year. It's a hallmark year in regenerative biology. It's the 250th anniversary for the first description of this, where Lazaro Spallanzani stated, but if salamanders regenerate their limbs, even when kept on dry ground, how comes it to pass that other land animals are not endued with the same power? Right, so why can these animals do it, and why can't we? It's a great tagline for my lab, but unfortunately in 2018, we still don't have a great explanation on how this works. But what do we know? So we know that they can re regenerate many tissues, and usually it is a practically perfect replica. And think of what you need to under, what these cells need to do in order to do that. It needs to know exactly what to grow back. For example, a limb is amputated at the mid-humerus. It needs, needs to grow back an elbow, wrist, and a hand. A limb is amputated at the radius ulna. It knows to grow back a wrist and a hand. So that means these cells have a coordinate system. They know where they're at. It's kind of like a zip code. And they need to change that zip code. So your zip code said you were an elbow cell. To make a hand, you need to change your identity into a hand cell. So how do they do this? So it turns out they can re-access their developmental programs, meaning they can go back in time to when they were an embryo and reuse those programs to change the cellular identity, for example, an elbow to a hand. So think of this a different way. You're on the top of a mountain. You're about to ski down. Skiing downhill is the easy part, right? And you come to a trailhead, you have to make a decision, go left or right. In this case, you go right, and you make multiple decisions along your way down the mountain. This is pretty much how development works. So a cell, you start it all as a single-celled zygote with all the potential in the world. And through development, you made all these decisions along the way to make every cell type of your body, your head, your limbs, your, your heart, or the 200 plus different cells uh, cell types that make up our bodies. So what's so special about the salamander is that it can ski uphill. So an amputation occurs, what happens is the cells can actually ski partly uphill, just a bit, duplicate themselves, and then turn into two different cell types to regenerate the missing structure. For example, an elbow turning into a hand. And this is the most important question in regenerative biology. How do they reaccess those programs? How do they ski uphill? So the question is, can human cells even do this? It turns out it might be easier than we really think. So in 2012, Shinya Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize by showing a human cell can go from the base camp all the way up to the summit by just activating a handful of genes. So what that means is we have the nuts and bolts to do this. We have the genes available. We just need to learn how to reactivate these genes. And that's where these special animals come in. They can tell us which genes to turn on and how to reaccess these dormant regenerative programs. So 
We could sit back and wait for Peter Parker to give us the formula, or we can learn from these regenerative animals, like our friend the amazing axolotl. Thank you. <laughs>